Hey guys and welcome back to the Hellfire Comms Ghiblifon. Today we are going to be taking a look at From Up on Poppy Hill, which um I've never actually watched before. I don't really know much about it, like, by proxy either, so uh, this one should be pretty interesting. Uh, if you need help syncing up our commentary to your copy of the movie, which obviously we can't provide for copyright reasons, check the instructions in the video description below. Otherwise we're just going to get right on in 3, 2, 1. Okay, uh, Richie, what is the premise from Up on Poppy Hill? About from Up on Poppy Hill, even. Yes, so from Up on Poppy Hill is a animated drama, so to speak, that's based on a uh, manga of the same name from the 1980s, um, illustrated by Chizuru Takahashi and written by Tetsuro Sayama, which basically tells the story of a... Uh, young girl called Umi Komatsuzaki in Yokohama, Japan, who has to deal with life after her father disappears, and it's all to do with a boarding house called Kokiko Manor, and to do with the newspaper club as well, and there's all sorts of different threads to it, and it's quite a charming little film. Which may come as a bit of a surprise to you, considering it's directed by Goro Miyazaki, who's the guy who obviously did Tales from Earthsea. Yes! However, I would say that this is definitely a much better film overall, and I think part of the reason for that is that the screenplay is written by Hayao Miyazaki. Ooh. So, uh, I mean, so, there is a through fare also in that Keiko Niwa also worked on the screenplay for this, as with the screenplay for Tales to Mercy, but the key difference is Hayao Miyazaki doing the screenplay for this one, and I think that does create a much better film overall. It seems like, uh, like, Hayao wanted to step in just to make sure it wasn't going to be another Tales of situation, so he's like, don't worry son, I've got your back on this one, you know, I'll, I'll let the blood feud lie, I'll handle the screenplay, you do the directing. Yeah, probably potentially something like that, but it is definitely a much better film overall. There's one major sticking point I have with it, and that's just because it... So, as with a lot of teen films, there is a romance at the heart of it. But there is a thread that just is incredibly uncomfortable to sit through, which you will understand when we get to it. Oh, um, this is that film! Yeah, I know what you're talking about. We'll see if you do, but yes, it's pretty <laughs> awkward to sit through. Uh, but I have to, I do like the whole thing with the naming of the, the manga in the film, because in Japanese it's Kokoriko Zakakara, which is from Kokiko Hill. That just sounds like a whole bunch of noise. Um, but Kokiko is a shade of red, which was originally the French vernacular name for wild corn poppy which is another name for the red poppies that here in the uk we think of so much with relation to flanders field and remembrance sunday and all that jazz so that is why the film's called from up on poppy hill despite the fact that pretty much the key things in the film it's all to do with coke co okay and not necessarily poppies but it all ties together and it's just quite nice actually I saw a bunch of really high-profile names as the credits were scrolling. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the voice cast? Um, I mean, you say a bunch of high-profile names. There's actually only a few that I would say are particularly famous. So you've got uh, Jamie Lee Curtis as the voice of Yoko, who is Umi's mother. Who obviously so many people would recognise from the Halloween films and being like one of the iconic Scream Queens, um, including also being in the TV show Scream Queens and then like the Disney Freaky Friday and all that jazz. Jamie Lee Curtis is awesome. Uh, you also have Gillian Anderson as the voice of Miki, um, who's a doctor in training at the apartment um, where Umi is staying. And obviously Gillian Anderson, we all know from the X-Files and so on and so forth, also being in Princess Mononoke. And then you have also got Aubrey Plaza as Hiro Kuji, um, who is an art college student who stays at this place. 
and there are a few others. Um, there's a lot of people in this cast that I would say have names that you would probably recognise, but aren't necessarily major in major roles in pretty much everything else they've been in. Um, I suppose you also have Ant the late Anton Yelchin, who was obviously um, Chekhov in the three reboot Star Trek films before he sadly passed away. That was such a tragedy. Oh god, yeah, it's awful, awful what happened. Forget. I was looking at the cast list earlier, and I was just thinking, this is probably the first Ghibli film that I've looked at the cast and thought, this is a real mixture in terms of the profile of the actors in it. Because generally what you've had with previous Ghibli films is the core cast being very high-profile performers, and maybe some of the lesser roles being filled by your typical Disney um, actors. But this one's got a much broader scope in terms of who it brings in, and I think that's actually quite nice. It fits the pleasant, everyone's in it together nostalgic tone that the film seems to have. Yeah, it's pretty comfy so far. Yeah, and it pre it stays pretty comfy throughout the entirety of it. It is it is an enjoyable film, and I think that this is the film that I would say shows that Goro Miyazaki does have some... Um, he, he can direct a film pretty decently, and while it's not necessarily perfect... It's a much better film than Tales from Earthsea, and showed progress, which is definitely good if you ask me. So is it just like a slice of life film then? I shouldn't expect any like mythical dragons to come raging out of the sky and blowing up the town? Definitely. You, you, you will not see any fantastical elements like that. This is a very, very normal Ghibli film. Just very slice of life, nice and cosy. A bit of family drama, a bit of relationship <laughs> drama. Pretty oh, much what you'd expect. Yes, indeed. Oh, I want to spoil, but I won't. I won't. <laughs> So yes, it certainly sounds like you know what the the, the twist <laughs> from Up on Poppy Hill is. <laughs> I was trying to think, is it this or is it The Wind Rises? But no, it's definitely this. It's definitely this. The Wind Rises is much more... Um, its love affair is much more normal. Can't read a, a lick of that. Don't worry, I can't either. <laughs> it's got little flags on it though. Oh, how adorable. I mean, it's slightly creepy because those are the flags that Umi, our protagonist, right, raises every single morning outside her boarding house. Huh. So what time period does this take place in? I think you may have mentioned it before, but I blacked out due to boredom. Um, so it uh, takes place in the 1960s. Okay. So 1963 Yokohama, and it it is fascinating because um, a lot of what's going on here is sort of the aftermath of World War Two and um, the Korean War and stuff that's kind of in at least at this point in time very recent history. Yeah, and so just. The historical basis here. Following Japan's defeat in Second World War, the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers assumed control of the Japanese merchant marine to return repatriates to their homelands. At the start of the Korean War, those ships, together with the Japanese crews, were pressed into service by the US military to carry forces and supplies to Korea. Japanese vessels played a significant role at the Incheon and Wonsan landings. The shipping form Tozai Kisen was among the most prominent firms involved, concluding an agreement with the US military's Japan Logistical Command to provide 122 vessels and around 1,300 crew for transport and landing work. 
According to estimates, 56 Japanese sailors and labourers were killed in the Korean War Zone in the first six months of the war alone. 23 of the deaths occurred when the Japanese crewed ships were sunk by mines. Official estimates of the total number of Japanese killed in the Korean War have never been published, nor have the US or Japanese governments officially recognised the role of Japanese non-combatants in the Korean War. The 1960s saw an escalating increase in student activism and campus revolts in Japan, as well as in other parts of the world. So... There's a lot of political history behind this time frame yeah. in, Jap- in Japan. So the boys are trying to just save their clubhouse, basically. Effectively, yes, because it's going to get shut down because it's obviously slightly decrepit. And not really fit for purpose. So is this her house, or just a boarding place she stays at? So it's a sort of boarding home, effectively, called, uh, I believe it's Coquelicot Manor. Okay. So there are a whole bunch of other women who live here, and it's it's quite quite fun. Some of her other family members do live here as well. You have... Uh, her younger siblings, Sora and Riku, and her grandmother, Hannah. You also have college student Sachiko Hirokuji and doctor in training Miko Miki Hokuto. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to go back for a second there. A couple of names that stuck out to me. Sora and Riku. Sora and Riku. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were fucking with me for a second there. <laughs> no, that, that is actually what, what they are called. Fair enough. Um... Let's see, can I find their voice actors? Because they're in here. So, yes. So, Sora is voiced by Isabel Furman. Uh-huh. Who is not someone that most people would probably recognise so much. Um, but she was Esther in the 2009 horror thriller film Orphan and Clove in The Hunger Games. Okay. And then Riku is voiced by Alex Wolf who is the uh, younger brother of... Wait a minute, no. Is it younger brother or younger sister? Just give me a second. No, it's, yeah, it's um, younger brother of Nat Wolf, who is um, arguably the more famous of the two. Uh-huh. But still think does a pretty decent job here. Music's pretty, uh, pretty consistently good so far. So I don't really have anything more to say, but uh, not really much has happened so far apart from phantom boys falling from flags. Something else that I should probably point out about Riku. I don't know whether this is just a Wikipedia glitch or whatever, um, but from the looks of things, Riku has two voice actors. One of them being Alex Wolf, and the other being Raymond Okoa who uh, was the voice of Arlo in The Good Dinosaur. Huh. I still haven't seen that. I still haven't seen it either. I feel sort of bad, but then I also don't, because it looks like sort of the that era of Pixar, where they, they've kind of been... Like, they they had a bit of a down period in terms of their films, I feel. Well, <sighs> just stick it in Disney Fun Free, mate. You know what we have to do. we got to do a blind watch of it. I'm sure that will go down brilliantly. <laughs> you sarcastic, patronising fuckoid. Sarcastic, not patronising. That's how it was patronising. Okay. I didn't catch a word of that. I didn't catch a word of it either, but some sort of... I think she's reading that poem from the, the school paper. It's slice of life. We're just going to go at our own pace in this commentary. Basically, yes. I mean, I have to say, it's a godsend that this film is only an hour and a half long. Because that's about the right time frame for this, I feel. Yeah. 
Oh man, he leapt off that building with a plum. I gotta say, he really put his all into it. He did, and he landed with a plum. Yeah, because or it was basically a cannonball. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Hmm. Also, yeah, I think you're gonna think you're weird when you're carrying a picture of him. And, uh, yeah. And to be honest, you look at it and just go, uh, right? Okay? Hmm. Strange. Um, yes, I feel probably should point out that Umi, our lead protagonist, is voiced by Sarah Bolger. Uh huh. Who has not necessarily been in a huge number of big roles other than being Princess Mary in the Tudors TV series. Okay. Um, for being in Stormbreaker, you know, the uh, Alex Ryder film that they did that was a bit of a disaster, but she was in that. Um, also, she was in the Spiderwick Chronicles. And she's also currently, or has guest starred as Princess Aurora in Once Upon a Time. So she's done a few things, but nothing hugely major. Although, she also voiced Eleanor Lamb in Bioshock 2. But I think she does a very good job here. Yeah, she's decent, so far. This place really needs a lack of pain. Although, if you got to tear it down, maybe, maybe not. You know? Yeah, but the thing is, is it's that whole thing of, this place has got lots of history... So really, it probably just needs a clean. Really, what they need right now is Sophie from How to Move in Castle. Oh, yeah. Because she knows a thing or two about cleaning slightly haphazard uh, buildings and getting them spick and span. I like this place because it's more like a miniature town than it is a boarding house. Uh, well, this is a school house thing. Um... It's the, the clubhouse, effectively. Well, it is the clubhouse, rather. So you've got Coquelico Manor, which is where Umi lives. This is the clubhouse, which is where the paper, school paper, runs from, effectively. I know. I was just commenting on the design and aesthetic of the place, Mr. Munn. Yes. Fucking science club. <laughs> also, I like how you, you've got the science club, you've got the philosophy club, and all sorts, and yeah, just the differences between them. And it's also quite funny because you look at this and obviously this is pretty much a male-centric clubhouse. And that would mostly explain why it's ended up in the state it has, because teenage boys in cleaning do not necessarily go together. Yeah, it's like fucking Lord the Flies up in this bitch. Yeah, I mean, look at that chandelier. Lovely chandelier, just covered in cobwebs. Really needs looking at, I feel. I'm loving the score. It's very funky. I know, it's got like a proper bluesy jazz feel to it. Um, so, I mean, the score was composed by Satoshi Takabe. Uh-huh. Not quite sure what other um, scores they've worked on. Um, but a nice little link is that uh, singer Aoi Tishima uh, sings the film's theme song, Summer of Farewells, from Up on Poppy Hill. And... Aoi Tishima was also, I think, I'm just just, just double checking, um, but she definitely sang uh, Teru's song in uh, Tales from Earthsea. So there's sort of a through fare there with Goro Miyazaki as well, so I think that's why she wanted to be involved. <laughs> uh We've all got that one smog friend. Indeed we do. Oh, I wish and I hadn't said that. I regret it the moment the words left my lips. Are you calling me the smog friend? No, I'm, I'm saying like, oh shit, I just described myself there. Oh, okay, so in this uh, 
the way this works, I'm um Shun, and you're what's his face? Yes, I am Tom. What's his face? Stevens. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the name of the blooming character. That's fine. Yeah, now I'm not going to be able to find it. God damn it. What a gentleman. Yes, but he's also being smooth as all hell. Seriously. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we're getting it on tonight if we weren't school children, and that would be entirely inappropriate. But <laughs> 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 uh, So this is the, uh, the school newspaper room, is that right? Yes. And basically what they're doing is they're allowing everyone to cheat on the um, mock tests that get given at school, because... Brilliant! Why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose they can get away with it, so why the hell not? Cheating is good until it's not, is the moral you should take from this. Well, cheating is good until you get caught is pretty much the, the done thing. Obviously... The real thing is cheating is never good because then you don't actually learn how to do the thing that you're meant to be doing. But some people are lazy and so cheating is the only way they're ever going to get anything done. Oh, right through my heart, Richie. Right through my heart. Too close. Too close. Well, it wasn't referring to you. I mean, it wasn't really <laughs> referring to anybody in particular. But if you're taking it to be you, then more power to you. Yeah, why not? I'll just take all the negative traits like some kind of negative trait lich. This is what happens when we have a charity meeting for Hellfire Comms. Yeah, it's just like, everybody in! <laughs> Although, uh, at that point, it's also a lot of us just go, wait, what time is it? Oh, shit, we've got a meeting today. Oh, yes, so we do. Um, Right, scramble, scramble, what are we doing, what are we doing? Oh, we're doing that thing. And then we get on with it. That's pretty much how our meetings go. <laughs> yeah, it works out in the end, is what you should take from that. Yes. Huh. Bit of a lonely thing to come home to. Yeah, but that's, that's just what happens when you kind of effectively run the house. That's rice, I'm assuming. I believe so, yes. And it's a nice way to get a proper measurement out of that. You've got your, um, you've got your box and you make sure you scoop off the top. So, yes, this right here is Sachiko, um, the art college student. You can tell by the fact that she's wearing a little apron and it's got loads of paint on it. <laughs> I like motifs like that. It's simple and easy to follow. It's very effective and she's voiced by Aubrey Plaza. Yeah, I call that right away. She's very, uh, I don't want to say monotone, but she's dry as fuck. Yeah, Aubrey Plaza's pretty damn awesome. And here are um, Umi's siblings, Riku and Sora. And Sora, there we is... uh, saw trying to get the autograph from uh, yes. Shun, was it? Yes, Shun Shun. We'll hear what he's properly called in a bit. Um, we also saw the maternal grandmother, uh -huh. Hannah, who is voiced by Edie Merman, who most people these days would probably recognise as being the voice of Gatamon and Angelwoman in the Digimon series, as well as obviously many other things, but I would say that's the sort of role that a lot of people would go towards. And it's also quite nice because she did 
do some ghibli dubs before this she was in kiki's delivery service and my neighbor totoro but that was only in the streamlined dub so obviously her performances in those roles are now pretty much lost to time um but she then did do additional voices in nausicaa and she has a role in the wind rises which is nice I've been meaning to ask, is this the Disney dog? Because it said G-Kids at the beginning. So, sort of what happened after Ponyo is that Disney sort of... I don't know what they've done with the rights to Ghibli films, but G-Kids have now effectively taken on the role of publishing Ghibli films. So, in September 2011... G-Kids announced the acquisition of the North American theatrical distribution rights to the Studio Ghibli Library that were previously held by Disney. Right. Disney, however, retained the home media distribution rights. And G-Kids has then managed the North American distribution of From Up on Poppy Hill, The Tale of Princess Kaguya, and When Marnie Was There, as well as the first time North American releases of Only Yesterday and Ocean Waves. And then in July of 2017, they announced that the uh, North American home media rights to the Ghibli Library, with the exception of Go With The Fireflies, had transitioned from Disney to G-Kids, and they decided that they were going to reissue the films beginning in October of 2017. Uh So, uh, basically, it's now moved to G-Kids, and to be honest, that's fine with me, because the dubs that they've done have been pretty stellar in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, this has been, um, I wouldn't say exceptional, but it's it's been consistently good so far. The next day. Artist depression hits again. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Yeah, she's one of those types of painters. So, it's a ship in a storm of colour. I don't really know, but the important bit is the uh, the flags, because obviously those are Umi's flags. Do we have any uh, naval flag knowledge on hand, Rich? (sighs) Tom. (laughs) The things I ask you to do, honestly. Why, oh why. Um, So, uh, we do have international maritime signal flags. Yes. uh, Which are used to communicate with ships. Um, there are various methods by which the flags can be used as signals, so each flag spells an alphabetic message, letter by letter. Uh, individual flags have specific standard meanings, well, specific and standard meanings, um, and one or more flags can form a code word whose meaning can be looked up in a code book. And also in yacht and dinghy racing, flags have other meanings. I would actually be able to theoretically tell you what... Um, the flags mean in From Up on Poppy Hill, but you will just have to bear with me <laughs> a few seconds. Oh, I'd love they spelled out the plot twist of the film. That'd be hilarious. Oh, okay, no. It, so what it is, is, because thankfully Wikipedia has this for me, um, it says, I pray for safe voyages. I'm trying to figure out which uh, flags that is that makes them up. I know there's one with a... No, never mind. I would I will have to look at the flags again to be able to tell you. Yeah, that's fine, mate. Save the Latin Quarter. Save it! Ah. 
Okay, good. I can actually tell you what the the, the, the flags are all now. Sweet. So the top one doesn't actually seem to be on here, which is really irritating. But the second two are U and W. So U is for uniform. It's um, the white and red checker, and that means you're running into danger. And the W is the um, blue square with a white square in it with a red square in it, which is I require medical assistance. Right. I'm not sure what the top triangular flag relates to, but uh, that's fine. What's the difference between the green ribbon on the girl's uniform and the red? Does it denote year? I believe so, yes. Like, you don't need to look that up, that's just a guess on my part. No, I, I think you are probably correct, and the, the reason I say that is because I think... Having, you know, just watched the entirety of Persona 4, the animation, because I had the Blu-rays for a while and hadn't gotten around to watching them, um, one of the things that you notice is that on their lapels, um, if it has uh, a one, they're like the freshman year. If it's two, then the sort of middle year or senior year or whatever. Right. So they do seem to, in Japan anyway, denote year through various factors. And it would make sense that that is the case here with the different neckerchiefs. Damn. Fucking blown the fuck out. And also, <laughs> I'm looking at this and thinking, oh, this, this, this sounds so familiar to what's happening at work. At really? The minute. Yeah, there's a, a semi-historical building that there's currently a consultation on the future of, um, because... Yeah, it's currently basically a massive money sink. Right. And it's all, do you want to keep it? Do you want to sell it for residential purposes? Or do you want to demolish it? And, uh, yeah, the debate rages on. Okay. Didn't exa I didn't really expect a song to break out here, but whatever works. <laughs> Do you also remember I wasn't expecting it to happen either, but I think the whole idea is that there are certain things which really tie people together, and also, you know, they're expecting the teachers to come and just thought, oh no, we need to be orderly right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing brings everyone together like a song, especially in the face of <laughs> oppressive authority, I suppose. If they're a bit of a mess, then uh, one, that doesn't go down well with uh, like Japanese teachers. It doesn't go down well with any teachers, but I know that Asian teachers, I think, in particular, are a bit more strict uh, than uh, a lot of Western teachers have become. I suppose that's part of the reason why you do end up with the stereotype of Asian kids always being very good at school. Uh -huh. Because, in general... Asian teachers tend to instill a bit more respect for themselves in those countries. Like, um, obviously, if you look at Chinese schools, they're very regimented. Perhaps too much so, but they get results and all of their students are incredibly polite. Whereas you look at any British school and you've got students mouthing off like there's no tomorrow and just being absolute dickheads. Yeah. Apparently the secondary school I was at got worse after I left. I'm not saying I was the rock that held everything together, but <laughs> who knows. Yeah, I think... I don't know what's happened to mine in regards of that, um, but I know that they've certainly pushed and pushed towards being a better school. Uh, um, uh. Potentially going above and beyond, like, trying to be a little bit more posh than it actually is. Yeah. Considering the... Uh, students that come into the school and their locate the places that they come from because you've got one half of the school that is going to be very middle class and the other half of the school which is going to be much less so yeah two two towns very close together but very different uh, populaces and um, so yeah they always try to be very much 
the posh middle class school, even though that really was not them. Sorry, I was just enjoying my stupid metaphor of the rock that holds everything in place. It's glue, Tom, you fucking Egypt. Oh, that's not fair. Everyone should get liquored. No one should get liquored. I've got to say, Aubrey is a perfect fit for this character, like, just in terms of visual design and voice direction. Oh, definitely. I think, on the whole, they did do a really good job of casting these roles. See, this one says, send nudes. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't have to tell that one out, because he did it for me. <laughs> well, yes. just, he's just impressing on every angle here. Shit, I think I'm falling for him. <laughs> <laughs> Move over, Baron. There is a new fire in my heart. Anyway. <clears throat> also, did they make that little hole in, like, the bush specifically to look through? It was perfectly angled. Not sure, but it was incredibly fitting. And also, um, I now know um, who uh, Shun's friend is. It is uh, Shiro. So that's what his name is. And he's voiced by... Once I've not, you know, freaked out on using the internet, um, voiced by Charlie Saxton, huh. who uh, provided the voice of Melvin in the video game Bully, um, and he's not really been in a huge number of big things. So apparently, he is playing Simon in. I think it's the. American version of Misfits. Right. Uh, that that just makes me feel uncomfortable. Are you not a fan of American Misfits? Well, no, because it doesn't exist yet. Oh, right. Um, the, it's in pre-production. Uh, the, the reason I'm just like, mm, is just because the original Misfits was actually really, really good. Really enjoyed Misfits back in the day. I'm going to have to stop you there. Season 1 was dope. Season 2, a little bit less, but still good. Season 3, I don't know what really happened there. I mean, yeah, it did get a little bit messy, but Simon was always the best character, so... We're talking about the fucking superhero show, right? Yes. Okay, whoo! Whoo, thank God. I don't know why I think there's another Misfits show, but it seems like the type of title that would get misplaced. It does, but obviously, thankfully not. Oh. Well, this relationship's going swimmingly. Yeah, it'd be a shame if anything weird happened to it. Yeah, I really would. Maybe you should put them on the roof for more visibility. Yeah, putting them, you know, with all the drying laundry doesn't seem like the best place, but it does add a bit of colour to it, so I suppose that helps. That's a really nice view, i got to say. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. It's the joy of being on top of a hill. You get beautiful views quite often. I'm a ship in the background. Now I'm in the foreground. But there's another ship in the background, and now I'm here again. That's going to be a bitch to sync up in, like, editing. Well, you're the one who decided to do that, so oh. uh, that's your fault. Oh, observational humour. Why, Tom? Why? That's enough looking at flags for now. There is never enough looking at flags, clearly.
Uh oh. Every photo is just revealing new and more traumatic secrets. Yep. Huh. I wonder what made him so stone-faced all of a sudden, Richie. I wonder, maybe is it something that's made this relationship a little bit awkward, perhaps? Oh, Lord have mercy! Passed away like a ghost in the night. <laughs> Oh, joyful, plinky music, you are a fucking liar, a betrayer, a ruse meister. <laughs> <laughs> this is a well-directed movie so far. Like, I gave, oh, um, yeah. was it, Garo Miyazaki? Goro Miyazaki. Goro Miyazaki. A lot of shit for Tales of Earthsea for, you know, shots taking too long, but he seems to have um, made it... A lot more snappy. Maybe that's to do with his father's screenplay. I don't know. But uh, it's a lot better paced. Oh, t hell yes. I think sort of those five years in between Tash Mercy and From Up and Poppy Hill coming out, he definitely learned a lot. Potentially, re yeah, in the production of Tash Mercy. And seeing the reaction, I think, realised the areas that he perhaps needed to work on. And when it came to this film, he definitely improved, and that's great. More secrets, eh? <laughs> Why does he have a copy of the photo? It's gonna be super ox. I wish we mean super awkward. Like the Urukai aren't gonna come storming down the street or anything. <laughs> Also, I like how they have brought a lot of gear with them to deal with this because, my word, you are going to need a lot of work to get this place looking tip-top. Yeah. Bring some hazmat suits, some, like, industrial strength cleaner, etc. Yeah. Just do anything you can. Sort of. I gotta say, this, the OST for this movie alone is getting in the B tier. Oh yeah, it's. I think this is actually the first Ghibli film to go like full jazz, and you know I'm really loving jazz because it's the sort of sound that Nintendo started to work towards as of late. Like it's mostly Mario that has the jazz sound, but it is it works so well, and it's that. Well, more big band. I yes, suppose, I was going to say. Yeah. It's the same sort of ilk, and it just works. How's the Mario Odyssey soundtrack? Because I haven't really, you know, listened to much of it, given that I'm trying to go in blind for our playthrough. Um, I really like it. I would say that the general reaction to it is it's probably not as overall phenomenal as, say, Galaxy's soundtrack. Um, but. I would say that there is definitely a couple of really good bangers in there, including, obviously, Jump Up Superstar, which is just, like, peak perfection. I, I can't believe Kate Higgins, the old voice of Tales from the Sonic franchise, song Jump Up Superstar. I know, it's insane, and it's so perfect. <laughs> He 
he's being standoffish all of a sudden. Yeah, it's almost like he's found something out that makes this super awkward. <laughs> that has so much weight given what we know. And also, it, it's really putting me in mind of um, GDPR, which is a whole thing that's coming into pretty much every business in March. So, just a brief overview is GDPR is General Data Protection, I think it's regulations, and basically it's all to do with how businesses store people's data. And basically every business across the country is freaking out about it because if businesses don't get it right, then there's like a ridiculous fine should anybody uh, catch you out. So, yeah, it's a pretty serious thing. Just throwing what you don't need is pretty much the, the standard of if we really don't need it, just get rid of it because it's potentially something that we really shouldn't have been keeping and probably desperately need to get rid of now. Huh, they really shouldn't be standing so close to that. Oh well, their problem, not mine. Nice framing with his eyes covered there. Yeah, it just shows that he's hiding something, clearly. Wax on, wax off. I wonder if she sensed something's wrong here. I mean, I would think that she would have sensed something's wrong because generally, um, women's intuition tends to be better with regards to relationship to guys' intuition, but once again, stereotypes. Yes, yeah, so that's unusual for you, mate. Right? Well, I mean, it, it, it's uh, annoyingly, it's one of those stereotypes that is based somewhat on reality. Well, that's a nice sentiment, but that's not what I was asking. Yeah, because, you know, if that guy is this real father, then that's going to it's gonna make things like, yeah, super orcs, because that, uh, that would mean that any relationship would be a, a wee bit 100% incestuous, and, yeah, that's what makes this film a little bit uncomfortable to watch. It all comes out just after the halfway mark. Yeah, because... It, it's annoying because it's one of those things where you look at it and you are rooting for Umi and Shun turned up together. But then you find out that they might be related and you just go, oh, I still sort of want to root for you, but this just makes it awkward. It's basically very similar to um, Daenerys and Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. I say despite not actually watching Game of Thrones. Same, but I get what you it, mean. But it's that whole thing of basically everyone is rooting for them to get together despite the fact that spoilers they may or may not be sort of maybe quite related. Although it's perhaps... That's more weird than this one, because this is siblings rather than auntie and uncle... Well, auntie and nephew, which is just... Ugh. But also it puts me in mind of um, a book called The Cement Garden. Uh-huh. Which is a fascinating book. Just really disturbing. So it's written by Ian McCune. It's the only book of his that I actually like. And yeah, it kind of involves a rather disturbing uh, incestuous few moments. And it's just... Oh, makes you want to vomit. Oh, the flags of incest. Raise them high. <laughs> Please, no. Hmm. 
Next time she looks out the window, she's going to see flags that just say N O. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since I figured out another character and he has spoken, I should probably voice point him out as well. So Akio Kazama, Shun's adoptive father, who was driving the boat, uh. is voiced by Chris Noth, who most people would recognise as being uh, Mike Logan in Law and Order. Um, Big on Sex and the City, and Peter Florick in The Good Wife. None of which are things that I have ever watched, so I wouldn't know. Um, apparently he has also voiced Lex Luthor before in Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Huh. But, yeah, he's not an actor that I have really come across much, if at all. Oh. Oh, this boarding house is going to be a little bit more empty when she comes home from school. Definitely. Well, I have to say, I'm listening to it and it really doesn't sound like Jamie Lee Curtis, even though I know that it is. Would it help if I we did this commentary again? But I digitally altered that character to be Jamie Lee Curtis. I mean, potentially that would help. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's necessary. It's, it's just because when I think of Jamie Lee Curtis, I think of a particular tone of voice and that doesn't sound like it. But then I know that it is her, so. Yeah. So that's a whole thing of like just changing the movie subtly reminds me of this one Oni players joke where um, I think it was Oni like wanted to animate like a quote unquote missing scene from the Iron Giant where Hogarth is just like I don't know doing something gross like picking his nose and eating it and just put it into the film and like putting it on pirate bay or something and wait for someone to discover it. <laughs> I mean that'd certainly be one thing to do. I mean, I think, because when we were doing Arietti, uh -huh. I was trying to find the UK dub of the film because I really wanted to listen to that one. Um, but I was looking at one particular website we have used for other dubs and actually had the correct dub of uh, Porco Rosso. But the dub that it had of Arietti sounded really, really wrong. So I don't know whether that was a fan dub of the film. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow made its way on there because it, oh, we should it do definitely that. didn't sound like the film that we watched. <laughs> we should totally do that. Let, well, I was going to say let's do a fan dub of Grave of the Fireflies, but now I'm just internally slapping myself. Yes, and while you're internally slapping yourself, I'm going to externally slap you through the computer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Would it be better if I was all the characters in Pompoko instead? Um, no, because that would just make me leave Health I Comms for good, because I couldn't face that. Pom Pogo. Tom Pogo. That's, re that's a really hard sentence to say for some reason. <laughs> Please, no. Here we go. Dun -dun. Oh, this is awkward. Well, I mean, you know, if they are brother and sister, they could just be brother and sister. Yeah, but feelings are in the mix now, and, you know, the heart wants what it wants at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, that is true, but it it's not going to go well just being friends, because, you know, the, if, that's not how feelings work. So just a shitty situation all around, really. Like, they didn't start things, 
you know, aware of these facts. It just came up midway through. Oh, definitely. I mean, it it is a thing that happens surprisingly regularly, I feel, because you always seem to hear stories every now and again of long-lost siblings getting together and then going, oh, shit, we're actually related. Fuck's sake. I mean, it was the whole plot of one story on EastEnders many years ago. Wait, wh which one are we talking about? There's been a lot of EastEnders plots. Um, Sharon and Dennis. Vaguely rings a bell. Um, so to go a bit more in depth, you've got um, Sharon, who is now Sharon Mitchell... And, um, there was, a, I, I want to say Dennis Waterman. Uh -huh. And there was sort of a whole, no, that's the name of an actor. <laughs> 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 that's, that's bad. Um, but yeah, there was a whole thing of, um, it's Dennis Rickman, that's it. Um, but yeah, there was a whole thing where potentially he was meant to be the son of Den Watts and it ends up being that while he's the real son of Dirty Den, Sharon was an adopted daughter and therefore they weren't actually related and therefore their relationship was totally fine. It's just a shame that, you know, he died horrifically on New Year's Eve. Ah. Oh. Yeah, it's one thing the EastEnders, which for those who don't know is a long-running British soap, uh, it loves making everybody miserable at Christmas and New Year. It's in fact it's the highlight of the season. Yeah, it's become pretty much a meme at this point. Yeah, you you just watch it for be, just be like, oh, I honestly, oh, there's there's Ryoko, there's Jamie Lee Curtis. So clearly I was thinking someone who was Jamie Lee Curtis was not Jamie Lee Curtis. That makes a lot more sense. There you go. <laughs> you see, I just needed to go on a ramble about uh, EastEnders and soaps at Christmas to get to that point. I'm going to assume that this is a dream sequence. No, really? What gave I mean, it away? What would have given you that idea, Tom? <laughs> the fact that she was asleep before this happened? The fact that, you know, we've got a sort of sepia-esque vignette effects going on. Stop making me try and feel things. I can't. My heart is black and dead. Tom? Yes? We already know that that's bullshit. So... Yeah. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> fucking softy. Like, oh my god. I mean, I'm probably worse than you are with respect to that, because... Like, I'm a bloody emotional wreck at the end of quite a lot of sad stories. I mean, I've I've gone on record before of saying I cried at the end of every single Leighton game bar Miracle Mask. I don't know whether I was... No, I wasn't really that... No, there was a bit at the end of... Uh, um, Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy that got me to tear up a bit. Oh. Um... But yeah, the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games always been a mess at the end of them. Um, the Kingdom Hearts games always seem to manage it somehow. Yeah, I'm just a bit of an emotional mess sometimes, it seems. Another thing I want to do, just like digitally implanting Jamie Lee Curtis into this movie, is just change all the pictures in the picture frames. To Jamie Lee Curtis? No, just put random YouTube celebrities in. <laughs> I mean, what would be better is if you randomly inserted pictures of spoons into <laughs> the photo frames, because then that would effectively turn this into From Up on the Room Hill, and I would be totally down for that because the room is the best worst film ever made. Uh, we're brother and sister. I fed up with this world. <laughs> <laughs> You're tearing me apart, Ubi. <laughs> so anyway, going back to my YouTubers digitally implanted into Up on Puppy Hill meme. Yes. Uh, we, we can't date Umi. We're both related to Markiplier. 
<laughs> oh, Tom, why do you do this to me? Um, you know, I'm just trying to spice up this slice of life, which honestly, um, I'm quite enjoying. Like, it's not the most filling sort of movie, but it's been consistently entertaining, I think. Oh, yeah. I think it manages to pull off that whole thing of being a slice of life film that is pretty much consistently engaging throughout its runtime. There's nothing major in terms of the plot. You've got the A plot of um, Umi and Shun, and then you've got the B plot of the uh, um, the clubhouse and how they sort of interrelate. And it's it works. <sighs> Don't say it. Don't say it. Nice save. This is so fucking awkward. I know, it's... Because it's the whole thing if you just want them to be together, but then it's just like, well, if the brother and sister then know that, like, that can't happen, but for God's sake, we want them to be together. Well, at least this place is getting uh, the relationship it needs. Oh, definitely. It's looking a lot better than it previously did. Well, you chimed in there before I finished my stupid analogy. Uh, Clubhouse X Healthcare. Oh, dear, Tom. Told you, <laughs> told you it was stupid. I know, I've run out of jokes at this point. Like, we were memeing it up about not knowing what the plot twist was. When it came out, before it was actually mentioned, that's it, my joke well ran dry. Well, thankfully, I have a little bit of trivia about the production of the film. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So, uh, in a press interview given after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, it was announced that the film's production was affected by the rolling blackouts imposed after this disaster. In particular, the animation process was forced to proceed in the night to minimise disruptions. When pressed about the progress, it was revealed that the animation was about 50% completed, though it was added that the animation would have otherwise been over 70% completed without the disaster. Um, however, Hayao Miyazaki assured the public that the film would still be released in July 16th, 2011. So obviously there was a pretty quick turnaround still on it. Yeah. Um, and he said that it was their responsibility to do that. Uh, Goro Miyazaki stated that while most of the staff had not been affected by the disaster, there were several who did go through a period of mental effectiveness because of what happened and that took some time to recover from. Goro Miyazaki also initially researched Yokohama, the place where the um, film takes place, uh-huh. intending to be faithful to the city's historical details. However, after realising that simply reenacting something at the time may seem real enough, but may not necessarily be beautiful, um, he decided to show the location as shimmering and bustling with life from the viewpoint of the characters. In deciding the Quartier Latin, which is the clubhouse, uh, Miyazaki worked with the art directors who added ideas about the amalgamation of clutter in the house's many rooms and attempted to look at the architecture of the building, but to also remember back to his college years and the clutter and filthiness that he lived through. So uh, the way the clubhouse looks and feels is in part related to uh, Goro Miyazaki's college years. And actually, also, one of the things that's quite nice to see is that, on the whole, um, From Up on Poppy Hill was received pretty well in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's the 14th highest grossing anime film of all time, at least it was when, when this note was taken. Wow. And between Grave of the Fireflies, Only Yesterday, Ocean Waves, Whisper of the Heart, and My Neighbours the Yamadas, it's the highest grossing Ghibli film about specialising in Japanese local customs, which comes behind The Wind Rises, um, but it's also the seventh best grossing film of... well, seventh best grossing Ghibli film in the US. 
which I do find to be particularly fascinating. But I think that's because by this point, everyone knows the name Studio Ghibli. And even though I wouldn't say that this is the film that most people would have gone to see, it probably did pique a few people's interest. And largely because then it sort of it's more aimed at that art house um, market. Yeah, very much so. And I think that's where a lot of Ghibli films have done particularly well. Um, before obviously Ghibli shut effectively, because when I went to see Tale of Princess Kaguya, that was a um, a picture house, which was effectively that sort of arty cinema. It, it yeah, it was. It wasn't packed, but there were still quite a few people in there, and they regularly were doing screenings of Ghibli films. Like Totoro seemed to turn up quite a lot. So yeah, it's nice to see that it did do quite well, and on the whole, it was received quite pretty well, quite well critically as well. And um, the consensus being gentle and nostalgic from Up and Poppy Hill is one of Studio Ghibli's sweeter efforts. And if it doesn't push the boundaries of the genre, it remains as engagingly lovely as Ghibli fans have come to expect, which I think does cover it quite well. Uh, it's quite snappy, the comedy in the movie. Definitely. I mean, the amount of time that they must have spent to get that perfect in terms of the unison, not talking about the filming side of things, but th the two characters getting that, it's pretty nuts, because uh, most people would not be able to be that in sync unless they were twins. Well, you know, a brother and sister in a doomed relationship. <laughs> 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 Sorry, just had to get one in there. Thank you, nerd man. So this is all to uh, see if they can get uh, the people who want to tear down the Latin clubhouse to stop, I guess? Effectively, yes. Um, let me just get the... Uh... Yeah, they, they want to convince the businessman to... Yeah, help not rip the entire place down. So I believe that this is Chief Director Tokumaru, who's the chairman of the high school and a businessman living in Tokyo, based on the Tokuma Shoten president, Yasuyoshi Tokuma. Uh-huh. And Tokuma Shoten are um, a large entertainment company. And he is voiced by Bo Bridges, who uh, I suppose would be most well known as being the uh, elder brother of Jeff Bridges. Obviously, he has done, he's got his own career and has done many, many, many films, but I would say that that's probably how most people of our generation perhaps would recognise him. I feel like if they didn't get Bo Bridges for the role, um, Ed Asner would have fit pretty well with this character. This might make me sound slightly bad, but Ed Asner, what's he been in? Just a little, just a little Pixar film called Up. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you see, I don't remember Up very well. That's one of the Ghibli films where. Ghibli films, Pixar films, love the first 10 minutes. The first 10 minutes break my heart every time, but then the rest of the film's a bit boring. Mm -hmm. So it's not one of the ones where I've kind of paid it that much heed. Oh, 
Huh. Can't believe that worked. I know, that was surprisingly easy. <laughs> You see, all all it needed was just a really heartfelt story, and clearly this guy's actually got a heart of gold, so he's just like, you know what, let's go for it. Yeah. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's probably what both of them were thinking, just like, why, for the love of God. <laughs> okay, this is just parody at this point. And it's really annoying because they're a really cute couple, and yet it's just like, oh, they might be related. <laughs> no, they are related. That's the point of the film, mate. Well, they think they're related. That That's the key thing. Oh, is there a twist upon a twist? There might indeed be a twist upon a twist. Sacre bleu! <laughs> but we've got a bit of a ways to go before any potential situation of a twist um, upon a twist arrives. Women doctors, that'll never happen. I forget, was that a thing in the 60s? I am very out of time right now. Um... Let's find out. Because, I mean, there's some things which obviously didn't happen until surprisingly late in history. First woman doctor would provide would suffice. Probably yes. So Elizabeth Blackwell, MD, is most well, she's cited as being the first female doctor in America anyway. Uh-huh. Um and that is uh she was born eighteen twenty one, died nineteen ten. Okay. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, I think, is someone else. Um, she's the first woman to qualify in Britain as a physician and surgeon. Right. So that was the 1800s. So mid, like, mid 1800s is pretty much what you're looking at for when female doctors became a thing. Oh, the feels! Damn you, Miyazaki clan! You have brought emotions <laughs> upon me! <laughs> hey, it's Jamie Lee Curtis! Finally! That's adorable, though. All she has to see is her mom's shoes and she knows she's home. Yep. That doesn't really work in the English dub, I don't think. No, it doesn't. Uh, but it's just one of the things that happens, really, isn't it? Because I'm in love with someone who I think is my brother, and it's super awkward. All right, wait for the twist upon a twist. I'm in trance now. I need to know all the details. 
Come on, Jamie Lee Curtis, help us make this film have a happy ending. Yeah, it was a great flashback. Hmm. Okay, where are we going with this? Oh, okay. They're adopted brother and sisters, or like step, or whatever. So, well, basically, the whole gist of this is they're not related. Yes, um, her father adopted Shun, um, but then he gave him away to another couple and, effectively, they adopted him. It's good. We're not related by blood. Yes, I've never been so happy. Yep. I'm not sure whether that robs the film of something. I don't know. Um, to be honest, I'm quite happy about it because it means that, you know, their cute relationship can actually be a thing. Uh Um, Because I think had it actually been real, it just would have... It just would have made the whole thing unsettling, like, you know, the whole Luke kissing Leia in Empire Strikes Back, and then all of a sudden you find out that, you know, they're related, and you're just like, oh, no, that was, that was, that was wrong. So th- this kind of removes that air of wrongness. It's just like, you, c- you can finally be together, and it's not going to be like the most awkward, ugh, thing ever. Well, I mean... If they went for a bittersweet ending, I think it may have had a bit more punch. I'm fine with things as it is, but I don't know, I feel a little bit deflated. Yeah, um, I think you'll probably be, well, you might be happier with the way the film ends in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Then, because there is still an element of bittersweetness, but it's not going to be with relation to that bit. I like how he's just like, eh, you guys don't matter, I'm here for the girl who actually got me to come here. <laughs> Is that Gaspard Payne on the right, by the way? The left, sorry. God, I'm all fucked up with directions and whatnot. <laughs> it's fine, I'm just looking at this and just thinking, they did a really damn good job of this. They really did.
Fuck all, sir. <laughs> I mean, at least they were honest about it. I like this guy. He's very jovial. Oh, definitely. You must resolve the plot! You must! <laughs> I mean, it's the only way that we can get a proper happy ending, because obviously Umi sort of knows the truth now, but um, she doesn't actually know it yet. So yeah, since, you know, we are getting into the last stretch of the film, I should probably point out some of the other actors and actresses that I haven't actually properly mentioned, because... Um, I've not been able to pinpoint them very well. Okay. Um, but two of uh, Umi's friends and classmates, uh, Nobuko and Yuko. Are so Nobuko is voiced by Emily Osment, who is obviously um, Hey Joel Osment's younger sister, but also she is most well known for being Gertie Giggled in Spy Kids 2, Spy Kids 3D, as well as being Lily in Hannah Montana. You then have Bridget Hoffman as Yuko, and Bridget Hoffman uh, has done a few things mostly under other names, um, but you probably recognise her most as being the voice of Atoli slash Michiru Tajima in Dot Hack GU stuff, um, and also Cosmos in Xenosaga episode 1 and episode 3. <laughs> oh, I know, best ending. It's super happy. Yes. So the new building's still getting made, but just in a different location. Oh my god. Basically, yes. What's also quite interesting is that the uh, high school world history teacher in the Japanese dub is actually voiced by Goro Miyazaki himself. Oh, that's great. Um, but in this version of the film, he is voiced by Ronan Farrow, who is the son of Mia Farrow and Woody Allen. And you then have a guy called Jigen, or Jen, who is voiced by comedian ventriloquist Jeff Dunham. Oh, jeez. Which is quite awesome. Um, and then the Philosophy Club's president is voiced by uh, Ron Howard. has obviously been in many, many, many things. Um, and is also actually also going to be in Solo, a Star Wars story. And I think the only other person that I haven't... Well, there's one character who hasn't turned up yet, who I will be able to tell you. Um, but the other one is Saori Makimura, who's one of the boarders at the boarding house, and she's voiced by Christina Hendricks, who's most well known for being Joan Holloway on Mad Men. Yes. But yes, we are about to meet the uh, other character, because he is the old ship um, ship captain. Dude, this music is like, yes, it is finale time, and you are watching, motherfucker. Indeed it is. Okay, we are going to ram the ship at full speed. Here we go. <laughs> you know, I like how they've 
held the ship from going out very far by just going, No! We've got a, a relationship to get started here and we need you to talk to them! Oh, well, let's hope this boat ain't called the Titanic, because I don't need another ship sinking. <laughs> don't just uh, write that on my grave. I don't think I'll ever say a better line. Probably not. Funnily enough, um, this year actually marks the uh, 20th anniversary of the film Titanic. Well, book on my shoes. When it came out in cinemas was about, I think it was the 19th of December, 20, uh, 19... 97. Bloody hell. Look back and think of that. That's, that's, um, not that long ago, but it is. It's just like, oh my god. Um, but yeah. Alright, let, let's listen to this now. Yes. Well, I should point out, he, this gentleman here is voiced by Bruce Dern, who has, um, most well known for being in Coming Home, Nebraska, and then he's also been in, uh, he was Tom Cannon in the 1974 Great Gatsby. Okay, that'll do. That'll do, mate. Come on. Perfect. Oh. So they're the kids of those two men, essentially. Yes. And it's been quite nice because obviously they were best friends and now their kids have found love together. And that's just really sweet. And that basically brings us to the end of From Upon Poppy Hill. Ah. So yeah, it's it's just a really cosy, nostalgic film that has a bit of a odd drama moment with the whole oh my god, this might be incest. Uh -huh. uh, but apart from that, it's just really cute, and I think it is a marked improvement on Goro Miyazaki's last film. Very much so. And I think yeah, it's just a really lovely lovely film with a great sense of humor a really good score as well oh fantastic um, so yeah so on the whole i think i'm probably going to give it a b same i'm going to give it a solid b great score like i was impressed with arietti and i thought well the next score is just going to be typical ghibli um i don't know if i like it more than arietti's score but it definitely suits the film uh the characters are fun they're entertaining uh the comedy well done not uh you know, it doesn't linger too long on any joke, and it doesn't linger too long on any scene, so the, the pacing's much snappier, which I really appreciate. Like I said, I think if they went for the whole thing, and, you know, they were blood-related, but they just couldn't be together, and they ended up, you know, apart, maybe going to different countries, that might have had more emotional weight, but I don't think that's what the thing was going for, so I'm not going to judge it for that, and my score has not changed because of that, so yeah. From Up on Bobby Hill gets a B from both Richie and myself. What are we watching next time, mate? So, next on the list is Hayao Miyazaki's, what was meant to be his final masterpiece, but which is now going to be his penultimate masterpiece as long as he finishes his next film, The Wind Rises. Beautiful. Alright guys, that'll do it for us. Thanks for watching our commentary on From Up on Poppy Hill. Bye-bye. <laughs>